Hey, uh, I'm really tired, and I got work in a few hours, and I'm really bored. So that's why this video is happening. So there's a High Guardian Spice Reddit. I think a lot of you know this by now. Uh, I don't really go on there or anywhere involving High Guardian Spice, honestly. You think I would because, you know, I'm the High Guardian Spice guy now, but nah. Now, I've seen people comment that there are no fans of High Guardian Spice. I think I've made, I said that as a joke at one point, but no, there really are. There's, uh, there's a few. Now, this show doesn't have a lot of people who like it for reasons. I'll let you figure out what those reasons are for yourself. Now, pretty much anything, no matter how bad it is, is guaranteed to have a fan base who are, like, steel-willed to defend it, no matter what happens. Like, if you enjoy this show, that's fine. I'm actually friends with people who do, in fact, like this show, uh, unironically. Uh, I have no problem with that. You can enjoy whatever you want to. If it makes you feel happy, that's great. Me, personally, I didn't. Uh, you, you probably know that by now. And it's for a lot of reasons, mostly because it's very poorly written. But according to some people, tis not the case. No, this show is actually, uh, very well written, and all the flaws that us measly critics point out are merely fantasies of trick of the mind. I really don't get why some of these people have to be so stubborn on this show in particular. It's kind of like watching someone stand up, you know, full plate armor to defend a pile of garbage from assault by the garbage man. But uh, speaking of garbage, I'm actually excited today because we're going to get to tackle another defense of High Guardian Spice. But this isn't like the last one I did where I talked about that guy who was like defending the show but hadn't watched a single episode, which is hilarious when you think about it. They haven't even seen it. They're still like, no, I gotta, I gotta fight for this show I haven't watched. But this person actually has seen the show which I don't know if defending the show after having actually watched it is any better. Um, but, y you know, well, what can you do? So again, this is coming from Reddit. Uh, I don't go on Reddit a lot, so I haven't really been seeing a lot of this. But someone sent it to me over Discord, so I decided to finally, you know, go check it out. Also, just so we're clear, uh, I'm not telling you to, like, go to the Reddit and, like, say a bunch of shit or try and make them angry or anything like that. Uh, I'm not the internet police. I can't tell you what you are and aren't allowed to do, but... Uh, I recommend not doing that. That's not what this video is about. I will say up front, I haven't read all of this because I want this to be my live reaction to these arguments to see, like, what I can come up with off the top of my head in response. And who knows, maybe they have some, like, 4D, 1000 IQ to explain all the things that are going on in this show. So let's just jump right into it. Debunking common criticism of High Guardian Spice because I am insecure and petty. Oh, hey, me too. It's no secret that High Guardian Spice had a vitriol response when it was released, and the narrative, even for none of the anti-SJW crowd, seemed to be that it was just mediocre or flat-out bad. I'm more on the flat-out bad side, if you haven't figured out yet, that's just where I stand. For someone who seemed to be spoiled for choice for cartoons nowadays, that type of noise is utter nonsense. Because if you ask me, High Guardian Spice stands tall against the competition, and it's one of my personal favorites. Does not help that some of the criticisms are quite banal, so I'm here to debunk some of them. The funniest part about this is I kind of agree, because after seeing Velma, High Guardian Spice does stand tall. The only problem is, that's not a good thing. It stands tall because it hit rock bottom, but then everyone else started digging deeper and deeper to just show it up. Now, a lot of terrible shows get released, and High Guardian Spice is far from the worst, but it's kind of like comparing garbage that's on fire to regular garbage. Like, sure, one of them's on fire, and fire is technically worse, but the other one is still garbage. But anyway, here's the part where we start talking about the criticism, so let's just break this down. I don't know what a Guardian is. Oh boy, I'm excited for this. I've been waiting, waiting for a long time to hear what the explanation of being a guardian is. So this person's about to answer that question right here and now. The wait is over. No more questions after this. Let's go. Let's see it. Here is one of my favorite. A guardian is someone that goes to school to learn to fight art and more so they go on quests and presumably get pe <laughs> Presumably? Oh my god, even I didn't think about that. We don't know if they're getting paid for this or not, because they never say. So for all we know, like, they're just rushing into battle and not getting anything in compensation, because they never say they get, like, a paycheck or anything. So that's another question to the list. Do Guardians get paid? Is this a job, or is it, like, community volunteer work? But circling back to the other explanations in that sentence, um, they go to school to learn to fight, 
and art for some reason. What they use the art for, I, d I don't know. Why are they learning art specifically? Is this an art school? Because it seems like it's a school where you have to go out to death caves to die, and you're wasting time. You could be training to learn how to make pots, which is kind of dumb. And on top of that, a lot of the classes they have have little to do with the quests we actually see them go on. Like, they learn about ethics, but, you know, they're very unethical, considering they went into a cave to steal healing water, which Sage says caused the animals in the environment to mutate due to the lack of magic. So they literally caused more problems by doing the mission. Doesn't sound very ethical to me. And also they learn things like translating runes, which they never do on any mission in the show. Is that something Guardians do? Rune translation? Like, ever? I don't remember them doing that at all. Apparently Caraway can see the future with those magic runes. Maybe he can use those runes to figure out what a Guardian is and explain it to me, because this person's not doing a great job so far. They also mention going on quests. What quests? Quests from who? Who do they accept quests from? We see the quests they go on are one that the Guardians give them, and another from the Guardian's sister academy, and pretty much everything else seems to just be random. So who's giving out the quests? Do they accept quests from anybody? Is it only people in this kingdom? Is it only people in Lingarth? We have no idea. Who's handing out quests, and on whose authority do they accept them? Can they just accept any quest they want, or does the triad have to orchestrate it like they do with the girls? It's never explained. So, so far, not only do I not know what a Guardian is, but I came out with more questions like whether or not they get paid. So, this explanation isn't going so great. Also, just from reading that small snippet, I'm seeing the inklings of something that is probably going to be more prevalent through the rest of this as we go through it. But that's doing the writing for the writers. Basically, fans of things like to create theories or explanations based on some piecemeal evidence to try and explain certain things in a show. And that's fine, but I have a problem with it when they try to use fan theories to get around bad writing. To say, oh no, it's not poorly written, because if you look at this and look at this and you combine all these pieces together, then it says that they do this. But in actuality, the writers probably didn't think of that at all. You're actively trying to write their own story for them. Even if we assume this person's right, and the explanation of what a Guardian is is buried deep within the show when you have to piece it together yourself, which I personally don't think it is, the fact that most people who watch through this still have no idea what a Guardian is says to me that it's so poorly explained. Now, unless you're purposefully making things confusing for the sake of the narrative or like it's some artistic reason, I think it's really up to the writer to properly explain key concepts to the audience. If your audience can't get something crucial unless they piece together these weird half-baked theories, then I think there's a problem that you should solve in your writing. I'm not saying you can't make things confusing, but usually when people do that in good stories, it's on purpose, and here I don't think it was. I think it's very likely the writers don't even know what a Guardian is, let alone us. Look through the visual cues. It's not hard to figure out. Going to High Guardian Academy, learn to craft, and the Sea Serpent episode is an example on what a job for a Guardian might look like. Again, I don't think it's as obvious as this person is making it out to be. Like, they said in their own explanation, we don't know if they get paid or not. They just added another question onto the huge list of things we don't know about a Guardian. The things we do get are few and far between and don't explain very much at all. And again, it's not our job to write what a Guardian is and write what their jobs are. That's the writer's job. They're the ones who have to come up with that stuff. Anyway, the next criticism they talk about is magic being poorly explained, so let's go on to that. I have the feeling they were staring at a wall this whole time. Old magic uses glowy glyphs. New magic uses sticks and stuff. New magic is more potent and efficient and poops on the planet. Also, they are an allegory for tradition and progress. All right, so you guys already know my feelings on the magic system, so I have particular beef with this one. One thing that interests me is they say that new magic poops on the planet, quote unquote. That isn't actually said throughout the series. You can try and piece that together because there's a scene where time is looking at the rot when they say new magic. So I guess the implication is that new magic is causing the rot, even though Nappy Cat uses a terror sphere at one point to get rid of the rot on a tree. We also hear Sage say that when her mom used magic, she would give back to the earth, like she would plant a tree or something, which is supposed to be a part of old magic, but Sage never does that. Anytime she uses old magic, she just kind of yeets runes out there without a care in the world. So is she technically draining energy from the planet and not giving it back when she does that? 
It could also be that that scene she was drawing runes in the air was written before they decided to add in all the logic of, like, planting trees and giving back to the Earth. So the writers just didn't think about it. But forgetting that, again, they're doing the same thing here where they just say, yeah, it's explained when it's really not. Like, a one-off line from Sage about old magic and cauldrons and wands or whatever does not fully explain the entire magic system. There are still loads of unanswered questions. And if it does actually work the way that I'm thinking it does, where they both drain energy from the planet, you can just give it back by doing things like planting trees, couldn't the new magic users also do that? That would make old magic kind of entirely pointless, wouldn't it? But again, these are just theories we can come up with because there's so many holes in the magic system on how it works that you can pretty much say anything. Again, the potions teacher literally says, new magic can do anything. Also, one thing I will say that we definitely know isn't true is this person says that new magic uses sticks and stuff, but Sage says that wands exist, not terraspheres, regular old wands that are considered old magic. So old magic uses sticks and stuff too. What separates a normal wand from a terrasphere? What makes new magic new? If the only answer is terrasphere the end, then not only is that incredibly vague, but it also says nothing about how they make terraspheres or how you recharge terraspheres or what terraspheres even do for the most part. What separates it from old magic? And they also bring up the whole allegory against like traditionalism and progressivism and whatever else. And yeah, that allegory isn't subtle at all. These writers know nothing about subtlety, so it's just kind of very on the nose. In fact, it's so on the nose that they expect you to just guess that terraspheres are hurting the environment just by the nature of they're new and they're better, so they must be hurting the environment, right? The rot is kind of a core plot element that barely gets explained. Like, if terraspheres are causing the rot, you'd think it would be a good idea to explain that to the audience, like ever? Here's a suggestion. Have a flashback with Sage's mother where Sage's mom explains why she doesn't like new magic. Have her say something like, it drains the energy from the earth, or it's unholy, or something. Anything so that we can actually draw the connection between new magic and the rot ourselves. Just due to the fact that so little of this is explained, you can actually come at this show with the idea that old magic just sucks, it's worse than new magic in every way, and anyone who uses old magic over new magic is an idiot. Just like Amarilla said, and that theory technically would hold water if you ignore the whole combining the two, but apparently nobody even knows how to do that except Sage and Caraway, and everyone else just doesn't use it. You'd think Mandrake, someone who's really good with Terraspheres and old magic and fighting, would have learned that so that he could use it. But no, I guess he just isn't skilled enough, even though he can beat, like, all the four girls at once, on his own. It doesn't make any sense. Identity problem. I don't know the details, but I think the gist is that High Guardian Spice is mostly cutesy-flavored. But because there is blood and swearing, somehow High Guardian Spice has an identity problem? Um, these things are not mutually exclusive. I mean, High Guardian Spice would not lose its identity if Rosemary would swing a sword and not have these things bleed afterwards. Blood and swearing has been established quite early on. Heck, there is even a warning before every episode. So again, I disagree here. First of all, blood is not something that's really established early on. The only thing we see before the cave episode is a little bit of blood from the manticore, but it isn't that extreme. It's not until all the way in the cave episode, which will I remind you is seven episodes in, that things suddenly get gory out of absolutely nowhere. There's a reason that part stands out from the rest of the series and had everyone, like, jump at it, because it was so out of nowhere. The monsters were suddenly gushing red blood everywhere as they got sliced in half. Rosemary got a cut on her side and started bleeding to death in the middle of the cave. It was completely different from the stuff we saw beforehand. The warning before each episode has become kind of a meme because it didn't seem like it needed to be there for the longest part of the series, which is why everyone who reviewed it pointed it out. Because again, all the gory stuff is happening in like episodes 7, 8, 9, basically the latter half of the series after it's already been established to be very cutesy and not that threatening. And they aren't going for the whole super cutesy but actually gory shtick. I don't think that's what they were trying to do. What's more likely is that the adult stuff was added later on as like sort of an addition. There's a theory that's been floating around that Crunchyroll basically forced them to make it more adult later on, and that's how the whole mature thing happened, and why a lot of the super mature scenes don't happen until very late in the series. Daft Pina has a video on it where he talks about it, and I think some of the crew members backed up that claim, but I'm not going to rewatch the whole thing to be sure, so if you want to find out about that, go watch that video right now. Uh, but anyway, back to this. 
As for the swearing, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it does feel very out of place when it happens. It doesn't fit. It felt like they were being forced to swear, like some extra-dimensional entity was forcing those words out of their mouths because it just didn't mesh with the whole vibe they were going for. Scenes like Amaryllis suddenly just saying bastard or time saying shit just out of nowhere, I don't think they really fit. If you disagree with me on that, then sure, whatever, but it's not really the biggest issue, I just think it's weird. The animation is bad. While yes, there are some notorious if you pause here moments, and fine, I guess I want them to be fixed as well, but for the most part, that animation works well enough, and organic character expressions make up for it. But what about the bread and pole JPEG? Also, what about the gorgeous backgrounds that are also visually distinct that seem to respect the color theory with deadly results? Just to me, ah. So before I rip into this again, I do agree. I think the backgrounds actually look really good. Whoever drew those, good job. But it also kind of sucks that the best parts of the series, the backgrounds, are in the background. And we have to focus on these jankly animated weird characters. And there are so many errors. Like, I've done videos cataloging hundreds of errors in a single episode and stuff like that. Mostly buttons. Oh my god, the buttons, dude. Those things are, they gotta be magic. They just teleport, disappear, they just vanish mid-scene, sometimes mid-animation. It's just terrible. The PNGs are funny, but those mostly disappear after the first episode, so it's whatever. I don't really care about the animation that much. I think it looks kind of bad, but there's been shows with bad animation that I love and shows with good animation that I hate. It's not a make or break thing. It is kind of distracting, though, whenever there's just an obvious watermark lamppost or PNG bread thrown in front of you and you just have to ignore it. Poor writing. No, not really. The characters have organic and dynamic personalities and usually can get their points across in two sentences or less. Again, I have to disagree. I feel like the personalities of these characters range from bland to outright contradictory. There are a lot of times where people will break character just for a dumb gag or do something they wouldn't and it just makes no sense. Like Parsley, who's the nice, caring one with a lot of patience, and according to her, doesn't hate anybody, and yet despite that, she's the one to break Aster's toes in whenever he minorly insults Rosemary, which is something I still don't think she would do. Or Time, someone who's shown to be more clever and more skilled than the other girls, and yet her master plan is to summon a demon who can make portals to talk to her father, when her ethics teacher is a demon who can make portals. Why would she not just go to the ethics teacher? Are you honestly telling me the ethics teacher, someone who's all about ethics, wouldn't help you if you told them your entire homeland was being destroyed by the rot and there's one guy who could probably fix it who also happens to be your father? But no, just summon the evil demon because that's totally going to work. And also put yourself inside the salt circle instead of the demon so that it could easily just run away if it wanted to. As for the dialogue, it's always very blunt with very little subtext. The characters just kind of say exactly what they're feeling out loud, and sometimes it can feel very robotic. And other times it transitions into kids' show dialogue, where they sound like they're talking to a group of kindergartners and having to explain basic concepts. This person doesn't provide any examples of the good dialogue between characters, uh, so I guess I'm not required to provide any examples either. But just to give you one, like the scene where Rosemary and Sage are talking to each other, uh, when they're about to enter the academy, and Rose is like, I'm gonna explode, and Sage is like, no, you're not gonna explode, and Rosemary's like, what, what would you do if I did, and they just kind of sit there and rattle off. That scene, that was terrible. I, I don't know what they were thinking there. It's hard to get across exactly what I mean if I didn't just give you, like, 500 examples of the dialogue, but this video's already getting too long, so why don't we just skip to the end? There's not much else here worth critiquing, I guess. They talk about the pacing and whatever, but I just don't have the energy after all that. And lastly, I might be speaking out of my bum, but I have the feeling that Crunchyroll saw little value in High Guardian Spice. No, you're not speaking out of your ass there, buddy. That's 100% that's true. You, you nailed it, bullseye. That's like the most factually accurate thing you said this entire debunk. That is 100% the case. And if you don't believe me, here, I have direct evidence, 100% proof right now, that Crunchyroll does not care about this show at all. I've played damn near the entire first episode while you were watching this, and I'm not even going to get claimed. They don't even care enough to put their copyright bots on it. So, it wanted to kill it faster, but on the other hand, they did not bother to meddle with the creative choices, so the artists were allowed to more what they want, despite not always having the biggest budget. You know we couldn't get to the end of a High Guardian Spice defense without the word budget at least popping up once. 
I do think Crunchyroll is kind of responsible for this whole thing falling apart since they were the management and they did, you know, market and advertise this product and let them make it. So it's not like they're completely absolved of all blame. But I do also think saying everything was Crunchyroll's fault is kind of disingenuous. There's just a lot of basic fuck-ups in the writing that I don't think a professional writer would have let get through this far, but somehow it did. And there are a lot of screw-ups on all sides, so saying this was just Crunchyroll being big evil is, I don't think, fully accurate. And as for the budget thing, I have to say, if you have any problems with anything I said throughout this video, this Redditor person, if they even see it, this video had a really small budget, a budget of zero dollars, in fact, so... Any flaws with it, forgiven. I didn't have a lot of money, so I couldn't make it good. As we all know, if you don't have a high budget, then it's gonna be bad. So to summarize this overly long video, this defense wasn't very good. A lot of the things that were supposed to be explained weren't, and I actually feel like I have more questions now somehow, like if Guardians get paid or not. I didn't expect to leave this defense with more questions about the show, because I thought I analyzed this thing to hell and back, but apparently not. And also, the episode's about to finish, so once again, copyright, not gonna happen, Crunchyroll doesn't care. I really did get through the whole episode in this, wow, I had a lot more to say than I thought I would, but, you know, that's just how it happens with me. If you don't like overly long videos, then, uh, welcome to the channel, I guess. And people wonder why there's an 11-hour critique of High Guardian Spice on this website. So anyway, that's pretty much all I had to say on this. Uh, don't harass this Redditor or whatever, they just want to defend a show they like, uh... And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, see you guys later. Peace.